Virginia Woolf once wrote that sometime in December 1910, human nature changed. It doesn't have to seem quite as mysterious as that, but something was happening around the beginning of the last century that had never happened before. New metro stations were ferrying people around the great cities of Europe and America quicker than ever before. Music was being recorded for the first time, and could be heard on radios for everyone to hear. And people were going to see moving pictures with sound, cinema, something entirely new. Science was also advancing in wider and deeper ways. Psychologists under the influence of Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung were exploring the deepest recesses of the human mind. The clocks of the world were being synchronized. Einstein's theory of relativity explored the mechanics of the universe, and rocket scientists like Herman Abirth would soon be trying to get humanity up among the stars. The modern world that we live in now was being born. People found this new world disorientating. So much was happening, and art responded with perhaps its most radical shift ever. A new generation of artists and writers would produce some of the most fresh and original works yet seen, looking at reinterpretations of what art is, and what the word art is even means. This new spirit of the age would be called modernism, a term that is actually extremely hard to define comprehensively, simply because there are so many new methods and modes of artistic and literary expressions that could fall under it. There are lists, pages long, of all the different artistic and literary movements that are funded between 1900 and 1930. It would frankly be pointless to list them all now, but this shows just how radical and heady this period of time was. Perhaps one of the more important artistic movements of this time was Surrealism. Surrealism was focused on a rejection of the rationalism which had been, to the Surrealists, really to blame for all the horrors and devastation caused by World War I. Instead of rationalism, Surrealism focused on a kind of dream logic, or fantasies coming from the unconscious. There was also a focus on interpretation from the scientific discoveries being made at the time, and Salvador Dali's paintings are a really good example of this. His famous image of the melding clocks is sometimes taken to be a reference to Einstein's theory of relativity, where time is relative, bendable, when there is a disruption of the time-space continuum. And these clocks are against a landscape that looks both correct, but feels somehow off, like how familiar landscapes feel in a dream. The Treachery of Images by René Magritte, sorry if I mispronounced that name by the way, <laughs> is at first sight a really ordinary image. It's it's just an object that people of the time would have seen every day of their lives. When we first look at the painting, it's just an ordinary wood smoking pipe. Questions about where this painting fits into the Surrealist movement aside for the moment. The only thing about the painting that might be strange is that it has the words C'est ne pas un pipe under the image. This is from French to English, this is not a pipe, which on the surface flatly contradicts the image. Obviously, the image is of a pipe. It could be few other things other than a pipe. And as an image of a pipe, it has been drawn really exceptionally well. And yet the piece itself is telling us that it isn't one. Why? The viewer is being invited to question this. Just talking about the piece itself as an image for a moment. Well, the words are just words, and it doesn't really matter what they say. Surrealism had a lot of uses for the scientific theories of the day, and then using them in some artistic way. A work of art, something concerned with symbols, or typically concerned with symbols, will always relate to the unconscious in some way. What any one person will associate with a pipe when they say this piece is obviously entirely subjective. And so, does it really matter that this image reminds someone of class and luxury? Just as an example? It would remind somebody else of their smoking habit. To another person, it might be a symbol of unhealthy decadence. This alone is far too simple. But there's probably something in this from the science of marketing. This painting looks very much like the style of advertisement that was popular at the time, and this can't really be taken as a coincidence. Advertisements are designed to draw your eyes to them with the simplicity of their image in a simple phrase. And with advertisement being everywhere, like on the sides of buses, or posted on the corners of streets, or in newspapers, or on the windows of trains, they were made to be read and seen, and so experienced very quickly, while on the move. The treachery of images is imitating this. It's a work that's attempting to be an advertisement for itself. It would be wrong to forget the commercialism in art. And this is as true of the art from the 1920s as it is today. 
As such, this piece is even more than just a work of art, it's a product. The irony of a piece of art made with the intention of being sold while imitating the main method of commercial stimulation, advertising, while having a caption that seems to bring an almost sarcastic attention to this irony, is what gave this piece its power. But this still might not fully explain the caption. After all, why this is not a pipe and not this is not an advert or something like that? There's another influence from the contemporary sciences at work here, linguistics. In the writing of the Swiss linguist, Ferdinand de Saussure, especially in Course in General Linguistics, 1916, he theorizes that the act of language production, or speaking, involves two distinct things on the part of the speaker, and the interrelation between these two things that he called the signifier and the signified, and this means that communication has been successful. When somebody says a word, like, for example, apple. The sound of the word is what suggests the thing. The sound is the signifier, while the signified is the concept being referred to, a piece of fruit. For example, a person trying to talk about an apple would use the word apple if they knew that the person they were talking to also speaks English, but the apple itself is not imbued with anything essential that means that we humans must call it an apple. In other languages, the same thing is called different things. In French, an apple is called a pomme. In German, it is an Affel. In Spanish, it is a Pomo. In Italian, it's a Mela. And there are many other words, or signifiers, for the same thing, the signified. And all of them basically mean an apple. But at the same time, in a language like French or Spanish, the word that refers to an apple could also refer to other things, not specifically an apple like it does in English or German. In Spanish, Pomo is also a colloquialism for an apple tree. Or at least it doesn't Spain itself, anyway. And in French, pomme applies more generally to things like apples, but not necessarily specifically apples. So what is being signified can also be slightly different sometimes. This also happens in English sometimes. When a British person hears the name UK, they might think of where they live. But someone in the Americas might think of a foreign country. The signifier is the same, while the signified might be vaguely the same, but it's not exactly the same, if that makes sense. Communication is only really successful when the signified and the signifiers are in harmony between two people attempting to communicate with each other. With this in mind, the image of a pipe might not just mean the thing that you put tobacco into and smoke. It can also mean a commercial product, or a metaphor for a kind of lifestyle. This is potentially why the piece as a whole looks like a bit of advertisement. What matters is that it will mean different things to different people. And as such, it is exactly what the caption says it is. It isn't a pipe. It's an image of a pipe. Or, or the painting itself is a way to signify what the image of a pipe represents. When asked about this painting later, Marguerite himself said, The famous pipe. How people reproached me for it. And yet, could you stuff my pipe? No, it's just a representation, is it not? So if I had written in my picture, this is a pipe, I'd have been lying. The subject and the representation of the subject are two completely different things. This is a lot like Ferdinand de Saussure's theory of language. The word apple is not, itself, an apple. It's just something that represents the idea of an apple. Thinking about this painting more abstractly, it's called the treachery of images. And this treachery is represented with an image of a thing with a caption saying that it is not what it appears to be. And so it's a treachery. Thinking of the pipe in this painting as just a representation of what a pipe symbolises might not really be enough. And that's quite a radical shift from the art of just a century before, which was quite realist. Realist art would depict something as realistically as possible, and the main point of the piece would be exactly what it was showing. For example, in the painting The Birth of Venus, the point of the painting was to show a mythological birth, and that was what was depicted. However, the pipe in the treachery of images is not really the point of it. The image could have been of anything, and it still would have had basically the same effect, such as the image of a book, with a caption reading, Se ne pa un livre. If it had this, then perhaps not really very much would have changed. The point is trying to ask, is if a piece of art always has to have a concrete meaning, a concrete meaning that is always to be correctly interpreted, or if it can have an entirely subjective meaning. Potentially, both of these things are true at once. There's not really any one thing that this painting could potentially convey, but perhaps it's better seen as a reflection of a small piece of the real world. 
Perhaps this piece is really suggesting that something, like an ordinary smoking pipe, could take on a whole other meaning when put in the right context. In this sense, this painting opened up a way for the pop art of the 1960s and people like Andy Warhol, who painted tins of soup to be shown in places of high culture, like an art gallery. Moving beyond the treachery of images for a moment, this is something that was really important to modernism as a whole, this mixture of high and low culture. This was exactly the reasoning behind Marcel Duchamp's fountain in 1916, where he took a public urinal and put it in an art gallery. So to return to the treachery of images one last time, what Marguerite is attempting with this piece is not just a statement about how we typically view art, and why we might be looking at art in a really shallow way. It might also be suggesting, in a grander sense, that things that we might not really consider to be worthy subjects are in fact perfectly worthy subjects for art. The ordinary can be just as beautiful and profound as the extraordinary. And if that's not true, then why not? What is really the purpose of art which doesn't take influence from the real world and the ordinary lives that people actually live? These are questions that we must continue to ask ourselves, because there might not really even be answers to them. Or if there are, these answers are as subjective and as numerous as the people there are to think about them, just as there are many subjective reactions to something like the image of a well-drawn pipe.